We've made the segue now to biologics from oral medicines. Why don't we start with the oldest ones? How do they work? How are they given? When do you use them? Uh, we'll start with the TNF blockers. George? So our TNF blockers out there are etanercept, adalimumab, and fliximab, and there's a slightly newer one, sertilizumab, pegol. So uh, what's interesting is this class actually has probably the most variety out of all the classes of biologics that we have uh, with regard to the different kinds of antibody designs they have, but also the dosing regimens. Um, I think if you look at a medication like infliximab that's an infused medicine, um, it's something that has a pretty rapid efficacy, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of antibodies can form to it, so you start to lose efficacy. So I found uh, myself not using very much of that nowadays. Um, if you look at a Tanercept, a very long track record of success with it, but the efficacy is just really not up to our modern standards of where we can get to people. So those conversations about you can get a person to about 70% on average PASI improvement with a Tanercept, that's, uh, that might have seemed great uh, 15 years ago, but nowadays it just <laughs> and the frequency so of injections, right. George, are, are you know just a lot. Particularly what what we have right, right. now with drugs that can be dosed every three exactly. months. I mean, twice weekly uh, for three months, and then yes. a step down. And I would agree also that not only is the efficacy at the end of three months compared to what we have now certainly less. But then when patients step down to once weekly dosing, they lose additional efficacy. That, that was my experience. Right. But like any other drug, you know, I've hit many a home run with Otanercept um, in, in my time. But I have to tell you, I have no one left on uh, Etanercept right now. They have really been, it has really been replaced. I, I'm, I'm sad to say, but the drugs that we have now are just so much more highly effective. And, and as we climb up that ladder of efficacy, our safety profiles have been far, far superior. Right, and that's where I wanted to chime in because we mentioned uh, efficacy, we mentioned uh, uh, frequency of dosage, and I think we also have to think about TNF inhibitors and their safety profile, right. which I think are clearly not, not as good as some of the newer, more targeted agents. I think you brought that up before, Mark. So um, I think we're in agreement that um, maybe a little bit old school there. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, speaking to those safety issues, we start to be more, this is where the tuberculosis, the hepatitis B reactivation, this is where this all came from. Like if you imagine a blank slate where we had all our biologics and we started with maybe the IL-23 class, we wouldn't even be thinking about this, right? So if you look back at the TNFs, that those are concerns, non-meloma, skin cancers, we're starting to see a slight signal with squamous cell carcinoma a little more than basal cells. So those are all things to think about with the TNF class. We go to adalimumab, sertilizumab pegol, it's an interesting one, it's kind of unique and that's a fragment and it's pegylated, it doesn't cross the placental barrier, there's some other attractive assets, but all of these in general, you know, every two week injections at the lengthiest and, and really that's something that if you, if you ask most patients, you just said, I have, a, I have a medication that works better, that's injected less frequently by far, most of them would probably tell you when, when can I sign up for it. Right? You know, George, the, um, the, the uh, pivotal clinical trials of almost all the newer agents have used a TNF inhibitor. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not the ex newest agents, but most of them have used a TNF inhibitor as the comparator drug. And so we have nice head-to-head -head trials um, showing the TNF agents and the newer agents, and the newer agents uniformly have, uh, have beaten out um, the older agents in terms of their efficacy. But I have to chime in that TNFs are still here to stay, of course, because um, there are certain contraindications because of comorbid conditions that our patients have, and certainly TNFs by far and away in the biologic uh, area are quite effective inflammatory bowel disease, and I hate to be the one that I'm always on the kick of inflammatory bowel disease, but certainly the nice thing about TNF in inhibitors is we can tell our patients as well, and our colleagues, is that you know they cover the joints, they cover the skin, and they cover the gut. And I think that that's a really important component of that particular class of agents, which still makes them unique despite the dosing frequencies. You know, uh, as long as you brought up um, psoriatic arthritis, I think it's sort of interesting to note that we've, we've all noted that the newer agents have better efficacy in, in terms of plaque psoriasis. But in psoriatic arthritis, I don't see that, you know, uh, that the bar has been raised. 
And I think uh, some of the TNF inhibitors do fairly similarly um, to some of the newer agents in terms of psoriatic arthritis. Uh, and I'm, I'm just, I, I, I sort of wonder why, and uh, at some point I'd like to see an agent that uh, also raises the bar in, ter in terms of psoriatic arthritis. I think what do you that, think, Mark, that, about that? That? Might, that might be coming from what we're seeing out of some publications with, with nil 17 but I mean, just going back to what you said about PSA, we're still supposed to, by guidelines, use that first and second line for psoriatic arthritis, right? And I think it's because of that length of data that we have. We know that psoriatic arthritis is a progressive, destructive joint disease, and so that confidence that you have over a longer time period of data and following patients out really, I think, has driven most of that, that we have that confidence that really it, it helps prevent progression of disease. And is that what you do with your patients typically? Uh, I, I find that optimizing for psoriatic arthritis is, is a rare thing I do because even patients who do have it, it's not that the other agents don't cover it. It's that if they really have severe enough PSA that it still breaks through with a different class of agent or something like that, then I might consider as a strong driver of a treatment choice. Because right now we're talking about a, an age where it's not just what is the best drug, right? It's what is the best drug for this patient. So what Absolutely. are the drivers here that I'm optimizing for in my treatment selection? Have we gotten a little too caught up on radiographic progression? I mean, I think that's particularly important. Uh, with adalidumab, that was a really important factor as we discussed with our patients who we suspect may have psoriatic arthritis. And certainly we now have that with 17 blockers, but then it comes into question with 12, 23, and maybe even with interleukin 23. Because progression of psoriatic arthritis, as Dr. Lebwall mentioned before, uh, that's a highly debilitating disease. So uh, I, I think TNFs are here to stay, but nevertheless, when we have these powerful agents with these dosing frequencies of you know, uh, four or six times a year, it's quite favorable for our patients when they're making those selections. Yeah, I will say, you know, I have uh, hardly ever, if ever, in the last couple of years prescribed a TNF blocker as my first choice for psoriasis. I actually routinely use them for sarcoid, granulum, annulari, for which they're all off-label. You know, uh, uh, and, and now, of course, on-label is hydradenitis, uh, although some data is coming about, out about some of the newer agents as well. Um, but there are many uses for TNF blockers, and I prescribe them almost every day that I practice, but they're hardly ever my first choice for psoriasis. I do have patients, though, who started on the oldest of the TNF blockers, which is etanercept, and are still clear. Uh, years and years later, uh, and, I, and I'm not taking those patients off. I, I will also point out, you know, we're, we have great data on the reduction in, car, in uh, heart attacks uh, in patients on TNF blockers. That data comes from registries where they almost all show a 50% reduction in heart attacks. Now, um, I bet that we're going to see that same data for the new drugs too, but they haven't been out long enough to establish that data. And so, so far, the TNF blockers still, you know, have an important place um, in, in a, an important role uh, in that as well.